Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. My co-host and partner in crime, Scott Bernstein, uh, is away and unable to join us. But we're super happy, super psyched to have a great guest with us this evening. Carrie Drobin from Phoenix, Arizona is, I mean, when you look at her CV, it's mad impressive, (laughs) as I would say. She's an attorney. She co-authored a case that was presented before the United States Supreme Court. On her uh, CV, she has, uh, um, was involved at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, She's an author, a TV producer, just a prolific uh, person, and we're really glad to have you uh, with us, Carrie. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's fun. So I actually, I think some of our listeners may know, I lived in Arizona for a while, and uh, one thing that was was interesting to me was how different the gangland landscape was from from Detroit. Here in Detroit, we're we're used to like hearing about the Italian mafia, uh, African American organized crime, and um, you don't hear as much about the bikers, although they are they are active here in Michigan. But um, I remember living in Arizona and flying back from Detroit one time. I had visited Michigan, flew back to Arizona. And in the Phoenix airport, seeing like Hell's Angels, like fully patched Hell's Angels. And I I was just like, as a Michigan guy, I was like, damn, like, you don't don't see that like around here. And then I spent a lot of time in Mesa, as I was telling Carrie, and and I I would see them all over the place. Like you would be be at like a taco shop or something in Mesa and like the, the bikers would walk in. So that's primarily what we're going to talk about today is the outlaw bikers and, and their culture and some of these cases. So um, you've, you've written a number of books about this. Um, tell us about, I mean, how did you get started and, and interested in, in writing about outlaw bikers? Well, it's kind of one of those, um, the first book, Running with the Devil, is um, it showcases the, the very famous ATF uh, infiltration of the Hells Angels. It was the first time ever that the Hells Angels had ever been infiltrated by law enforcement. So it was a really big case. But I kind of landed that case by accident. It's a really, the backstory is almost as interesting as the story. Um, I was I was asked to write the book. I was approached by the agent, Jay Dobbins, who was still undercover. He was still in that investigation working for the ATF when he asked me to write his story. And he approached me because at the time I was married to an undercover officer who was working on a task force that happened to be on Jay Dobbins' task force. Now, I didn't know what my husband was involved in at the time because everything was undercover. But it sort of serendipitously came my way because they knew I was a writer, they knew I was a lawyer, they knew that I could hold their secrets because it's it's a crime to sell your story while you're still employed with a federal agency and while you're involved in the undercover operation. So it was a very um, strange backdoor way of getting me involved. And, and I'll just say that when I was first asked to write the story, I... I absolutely said, no way. There is no way I am writing a book about the Hells Angels. <laughs> There's no way. Um, and especially an ongoing investigation. And so it was about by the third time they asked me to write their story is when I finally agreed to write it. So that was an odyssey in and of itself, but that's that's how it wound up in my lap. Wow. So a couple of things. First of all, it's interesting that Jay Dobbins was – even in real time, this this uh, fascinating undercover role, he he was already recognizing like this is a story that should be told. However, this I'm not sure how this is going to play out, but that's interesting that he was already thinking like this this needs to be told. People are going to want to hear about this. Right. Yeah. It, it was. I think um, not only did he want the story out, but the undercover operatives themselves had already decided it should be a movie. And they had already at one point, you know, sat around and figured out who was going to play their various roles and their parts. So they were already thinking very big because this was a landmark case. And at the time they were doing it, it was it was completely it was improvisation, street theater. They had no idea how far they were going to get in the investigation, where it was going to go, where it was going to lead. But they knew they were doing something big. Yeah. And so let me ask you, um, maybe you're not at liberty to disclose, but your husband at the time, is is that one of the people you talk about in the book? Like, was he part of that under that specific undercover operation? He was not part of that specific ruse, but okay. he was part of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. He, uh, okay. He's on the other side of it. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. That boy, I'd, I'd like, like, like to know more about it. <laughs> um, so 
And you were reluctant, obviously, the Hells Angels are a very serious organization. Um, so had you, were you aware at the time of their significant presence in Arizona? I mean, was like organized crime something that was even on your radar at that point? Well, I was, uh, I had worked as a prosecutor previously, but at the time I was approached to write the case, I was a defense attorney. So that in itself is also an interesting um, conflict, you know, between my husband and I, which is one of the reasons I didn't know a whole lot about what he was doing. <laughs> because, mm -hmm. You know, he's trying to catch them and I'm trying to free them. So, um, so it wasn't, I mean, it was on my radar. I was part of, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of prosecution of gang cases. And when I got into defense work, I was working on the defense side, but I had moved into the capital arena. So I was doing death penalty work by the time this case came around. But um, but I certainly knew of the Hells Angels. I knew what they were all about. Um, they were not on my radar, so to speak, but I definitely knew what they were involved in. Um, I knew they were, you know, an organized criminal, criminal syndicate. So, and I knew that nobody should really write about them. And I should just say the PS of this is I actually was living in Sonny Barger's neighborhood at the time wow. that I was approached to write this book. So that was a complete coincidence, strange <laughs> thing. But I would see Sonny Barger riding his motorcycle around town in uh, in Cape Creek. And so I, so I knew of them, but that's about all I knew wow. about them. So Sonny was, um, and actually we had another OG episode where we interviewed George Christie, who was a heavyweight with the Hells Angels himself, and and we talked a little bit about Sonny. So if, if audience members aren't aware, he he's like the big dog. He's like the Don. We're talking about outlaw bikers. I mean, he's one of the founding fathers of of the Hells Angels. So very significant individual. Just in, I mean, you don't even have to talk talk about crime. Just popular culture. Just just counterculture in general. He's a significant person. So so you you I, wow, that's crazy that you were in the same neighborhood as. So but did you ever meet him or have any interaction with him at the time? Just as a neighbor. No, I mean, I, I just, I knew of him and I knew, I mean, you know, the, the Hells Angels would have their Toys for Tot um, charity runs in, in Cave Creek and, you know, and they like to do a lot of these runs in these sort of sleeper communities that are, you know, picturesque and beautiful. So that happened to be one of them. Cave Creek was one of them where they would come and do their runs. So they would commandeer a lot of the, the eateries there. So we, I would see them and I certainly knew of them, but I didn't know to the extent that I was, you know, they were going to be such a massive part of my life. Right. <laughs> they were definitely, I mean, you talk about the presence that they had on the West Coast. I mean, it was, you know, the Hells Angels is Americana. I mean, that is America's passport to, you know, the or to organize crime. So, you know, I, I had always known that they were, you know, very involved in the community, but I, I don't think I knew to the extent, um, you know, that they were all about territorial, you know, capturing territories and chapters and all of that stuff but it quickly became a very big part of my life <laughs> yeah i mean so it's interesting also just to half jokingly here i bet that was actually a really safe neighborhood because no one's going to mess around in sunny barger's neighborhood i bet right you know the old joke like whoever the mafia guy lives like that's the street you want to live on because <laughs> nobody yeah. there's gonna be no breaking and entering or fooling around in that neighborhood you'll get in a lot of trouble right. <laughs> more trouble than you would with the cops <laughs> if you messed around on sunny's block i imagine so um well getting back to your book running with the devil it's, it's a really compelling uh book and um it's, um, I don't know how, how I should put this because I, I want people to read this, but it produced, it produces a lot of anxiety. <laughs> I know that's, I sh maybe shouldn't say that because I want people to buy your book and read it. But as you're reading it, um, you, you can feel the tension and because the stakes are really high, right? I mean, if they find out who, it's mostly about Bird or Jay Dobbins, but there are some other undercover operatives there. I mean, if they're, if they figure out who they are, right, they're, they're, they're going to kill them in all likelihood. So, um, I, I, I was wondering if you could speak to like the training in terms of how, how, how was Dobbins able to acclimate himself with that environment? Because we interviewed one time, another former undercover agent, uh, Jack Garcia, who, who was an undercover operative in the FBI and he infiltrated the Gambino crime family. And he talked about how you have to master everything in that subculture because one tiny thing can give you a way that you're not the real deal, that you're not real gangster, not a real outlaw. So how did he go about mastering those gestures and language and how you um, carry yourself to convince them that he was the real deal, a real outlaw? 
Well, so Jay Dobbins um, was already masterful at different undercover roles. He, he, all told in his career, he's been involved in maybe 500 different undercover investigations. So he had already the skills and he was already working in Bullhead City as a gun runner at the time. So he had developed a persona in Bullhead City before this case ever came about. And so um, he kind of lived that role. But when he came up with the the idea, it was actually kind of a a roundabout way, but there was a, the Harris shoot a, there was a shootout in in, um, Las Vegas, or uh, in a Harris casino and between the Hells Angels and the Mongols. And that kind of put the Hells Angels on the map for Jay Dobbins to be able to bring this or present this idea to his agency, where he said, you know, now we have to do something about this. We have to infiltrate this very violent, organized criminal syndicate. So he was already had his persona as a gun runner, and he decided to bring in a very trusted undercover informant with him. So he brought in this this guy named Pops. So the two of them already sort of knew that lifestyle and how to live in that in that world. Um, but he talks about it as he just does street theater. It's like method acting. You know, he he became the the person. He became that role. And his mantra, and actually all of their um, mantras whenever you work undercover, is to stay as close to the truth as possible because you don't want to, you know, mess up. So you keep your backstory very close to who you really are in case there's a slip up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so that's how he kind of prepared for it and is an improvisational thing. I mean, he developed his backstory. Pops had a backstory. They kind of, you know, brought in a couple of other members was a very small group originally that started and they all had their scripts. And so they, they play acted with this. And that the crazy thing about this case is not only did they improvise their roles and their backstories of who they were going to be in this world, but they also created a fictitious, fictitious Arizona chapter of a real group that only existed in Mexico at the time. So they became the solo angels. So it was like a mock fictitious solo angels chapter in Arizona because they had to be a chapter in order to infiltrate the hell's angels. So they were playing roles within roles. Yeah. It's, um, it's fascinating to read about how they were able to, so, so they adopt this role, they infiltrate the organization. And so the, you're, as you're saying, they have prior experience at, portraying uh, undercover work as outlaws or at least criminals. So that part, it sort of makes sense. One takeaway I have from the book is how the way they're really able to get the Hells Angels' attention is by not just being tough guys or outlaws, but that they're earners. They can make money. That's what gets the Hells Angels' attention. So it's not just that Jay is a tough guy, or as they call him, Bird, in the book, but he's, he's making money from gun running, and from debt collecting, and in his cover stories, debt collecting for the Italian mafia. Um, maybe he was involved in drug running to an extent. Is that implicated? I can't remember from the book. But either way, they know this guy's an earner. And it seems like, do you think, like, when I was reading your book, I thought, they're starting to let their guard down a little bit because the Hells Angels are supposed to be, you know, vet these guys. And I know they do to a certain extent. But every time Bird is flashing money... <laughs> They seem to really bring him in closer. Can you comment on that aspect of the the book? Right. No, that's absolutely true. I mean, the, the Hells Angels, actually all of the organized crime syndicates, they're all about territory and they're all about acquiring more territory and, and getting their foothold in something. So Jay was very adept at that and he would present himself as this very successful debt collector. And one of the things he was able to offer to the Hells Angels was that he could get them into Mexico. He could get them across the border to get that territory. So that was very attractive to them. And he did that by saying that he was, you know, he was a a solo angel and the international president was in Mexico, which was true. Well, he was, but that was his ruse to get them to really embrace him. And he would have to flash the money around and pretend he was this, this, he would always have his cell phone going, you know, Mm -hmm. where he was having conversations. A lot of times he was having conversations with his family, but he would pretend they were big wigs, you know, that he was making these connections with. So, so that was, that was part of his whole persona and his whole ruse to get them to embrace him. Yeah, I like in the book how there are moments where the Hells Angels start to talk to other Hells Angels from other territories, and they're saying, you know, I'm not sure about these guys. Like, I I'm, I don't remember hearing about them. Uh, I, you know, I'm not sure this idea they're they're you know from from a, a gang from Mexico, but they're operating in Arizona. 
or an outlaw club. I'm not sure about that. And then, and then Dobbins will propose some type of big score. And then all of a sudden <laughs> they go back to like, oh, okay, well, I'm sure he's cool. So come back. <laughs> right. But at, at first they'll, they're thinking about, I'm not sure about this guy. And when they think they can score, he's, he's back in the inner circle again. Right. And one of the, one of the defining victories, I guess, one, one of many in this case was when they got the, their foothold into Mesa Bob, who was, you know, the chapter president of the, of the Mesa Hells Angels. And, you know, Jay will talk about this. And I think it's mentioned in the book too, about how he had absolutely no idea whether or not he was going to win over Mesa Bob. I mean, it was a complete, almost a complete fluke that they did. But once they got in with Mesa Bob, he's the one that introduced them and vouched them to all the other chapters. And, and pretty soon they were all kind of um, vying for for uh, Jay and his group, you know, they all wanted him to join their chapter. And part of it was, you know, not only did he have something to offer, but he was also incredibly charismatic and incredibly good at his role. And so, in fact, he he says he got so into his part that, you know, he began to live that role. He began to be that person. So, and that was part of the the interesting, um, you know, that often happens with undercover operatives that they they get too involved or too engrossed in the part that they're playing, and they can't really separate that out. And that certainly happened to him. He was so enamored with with what he was doing and the role he was playing that he had a very difficult time extricating himself out of that role. Yeah, you feel uh, you can't help but feel bad when you're reading the book and you think about him saying like, okay, so I'm I'm with these outlaws two, three, four days in a row. And then I have to go to Home Depot for, to fix something at my own house or take my kid to, and like being able to shut that down, right? Like shut down the outlaw part and go back to just being a regular guy who goes to to the, you know, Home Depot or whatever, that, that, that was pretty stressful for him. And you, you get, you can get that sense reading your book. Yeah, it was very stressful. And I think he would even admit that um, he had a very difficult time doing that because his life was on the line. I mean, if one slip up, in fact, there is a slip up in Home Depot where he's he's with his daughter and he has to come up with a backstory for his daughter so that, you know, the Hells Angels believe what he's doing. So very hard to slip in and out of that role, because as he says, being a prospect for the Hells Angels is a 24-7 job. And the minute you pull out of that is the minute that your life is in danger. And and I actually had a lot of experience with that because, as I mentioned, my, my husband at the time was an undercover agent. So, you know, he also played those roles. And, you know, he worked in narcotics, but he played those roles where it was very difficult for him to suddenly step out of it and be, you know, the, the husband. You know, he's the husband one day and and the operative the next. So it, it was a really interesting sort of life imitating art moment for me <laughs> sure. because I really did understand that kind of world. Yeah. Well, it makes sense then that they would, they would, they, you would be per, a person they would trust and and confide in to tell this story. Um, so getting back to the chronology of the book. So he, he successfully infiltrates the Hell's Angels. He's not, he's not a member, but he's, he's part of the inner circle. They think he's a good enforcer, good earner. Uh, another thing that's really interesting about your book is because of how the Hell's Angels work, it's not like he's just working with one club. So you really get a sense of the whole landscape, that there are multiple chapters in Arizona, and he bounces back and forth. And, and as you point out, they're actually vying. They start to compete with each other they want him to prospect for them. And for those who don't know, prospect is like um, uh, you're, you're on the verge of becoming a, a full fledged member. You're not it's sort of like a, like a probationary period, right? Where right. you have to earn, earn your way in. So they'd all like for him to become a, a full member and start that process. Um, so tell us a little bit about the landscape of Arizona. I mean, how many hell's angels chapters are there, or at least, you know, give us an idea of how that how that works and how the, the politics of that and the territory, as you mentioned. So each um, chapter, I don't know how many there are now, but if you think about the so he could in one day or the span of one day. And I think this comes out in the book, too. He could be um, invited to a chapter party up in Flagstaff, for example. And at the same day later that night, be invited down to Tucson. So they're, they're a hundred miles apart. So he would be, you know, going in, in all different directions to, to all of these different clubhouses to, to prospect. And as a prospect, you're essentially a slave. You're a slave to 
you know, whoever's bringing you into the chapter. So there was one um, incident, for example, where he was, um, he was just called up and said, um, we just need you here and we need you to go after a rival gang. And, you know, as an undercover operative, this is like the, the agent's nightmare. You know, now they have to go in, get involved in a shootout with a rival gang. If they don't shoot and the rival gang happened to be the banditos. And so they were, they were summoned up to do this and they knew. So, so prospecting involves a series of tests. And so one of the tests that the Hells Angels will do is they'll, they'll see if, how loyal you are to the specific chapter you know, loyal to the club in general. So when they asked Jay and, and his solo angels to come out and, and um, shoot up these banditos to show their loyalty for the club, it put them in a terrible position because, you know, they're, they're lawmen. They're not going to go out and commit murder for the club. Well, they do, but we'll talk about that. Right. Um, so, so they were put in a very difficult position, and that's when they, you know, they had to they kind of came up with this ruse and said, we have to stop for gas. They stopped for gas. They made a phone call to their ATF um, handler and said, we get us out of this. So they were able to delay the bandito. So there wasn't a shootout. So, so those were, you know, so they passed that test. And so they impressed the chapters and that's what started this whole competition sort of among the chapters in Arizona. I mean, they, they're wide reaching. They have chapters in Mesa, they have chapters in Chandler, they have chapters. And these are, these are like, at least, I mean, like I mentioned, Flagstaff in, in Tucson is about four-hour drive. So they're on a motorcycle the whole time. So that's also exhausting. So it it created this um, enormous stress for for Jay, for the whole group actually, because they had to um, figure out how they were going to stay up for sometimes 24 hours or more to get to all of these different clubhouses. So they they became very popular by going and being loyal. And, and saying they were going to be willing to do anything. And yet it was such an exhausting job that they almost, you know, sabotaged themselves. I mean, I think at one point Jay was saying he was drinking like five Red Bulls a day, you know, popping pills to stay awake. So they, they really, it, it just wore on them. Yeah. I think he even at some point passes out, right? Like he's, he's just the exhaustion. Um, you, I mean, yeah. it's difficult to sustain. <laughs> And the, and the the bikers, at least in the book, they're they're using meth, right? So they're so they're going for days. But but if you're if you're the undercover guy and you can't do that, right? Like and you're just drinking Red Bulls uh, nonstop or coffee or something, and you're not used to that regiment, right? You just collapse. And I think that happens to him at one point in the in the book. Constantly, um, sort of like yeah, constantly walking that tightrope, and then in in between that getting home, like trying to be the father and, and the husband that he's trying to be. So if you imagine all of that happening at once, it's pretty horrible. I mean, those are, those are the tests really. They're drug tests. They're, you know, will you shoot and kill for the club? Um, one of the bigger ones, which was really difficult for them to get around was women. Mm -hmm. You know, they're thrown women constantly. And of course, Jay's not, you know, none of the operatives are going to do this, but Jay particularly is married. is not going to sleep around, you know, to prove his point. So that's how they, that's what fascinated me about this case is that it's the first time they brought in a female undercover operative, which was, it provided some pretty hilarious moments as they tried to get the right women to fulfill the role of Jay Dobbins old lady. Right. That's another great, uh, interesting moment in the book where he says, you know, I can't, yeah, I'm running out of excuses here in terms of why I'm not, you know, this promiscuous <laughs> outlaw like like the other members. Like we have to figure out a way that I have like a woman with me all the time so that I don't have to keep on coming up with these random excuses. So they introduce a female undercover agent. And um and and it's interesting that she sets these boundaries up right away that she's not just like some tweaker lady who's going to be pushed around. She, she presents herself as a real confidant of his and, and someone who can, is, is kind of gangster herself, right? Is, is, that, is that, would you say that was accurate? Yeah, I think uh, Jenna, Jenna was the role. I mean, she, she was a new recruit straight out of training. And so she had no undercover experience at all, but she looked the part. She was very voluptuous. She was very gregarious. She she could really kind of mine her way through um, these these uh, these uh, Hell's Angels. And one of the interesting things about that role was it was the first time the the operatives really had to deal with 
the, the female component to it. So not only was she serving a role for Jay to keep him, you know, test free basically, but she also realized there was a hierarchy among the women. So the women don't have it so great in these gangs either. I mean, they're usually um, property of, you know, they're passed around. They are kind of at the mercy of, of whomever wants them. So, so she developed a persona that was big, that protected her against that. So they liked her. And they didn't subject her to all of those female tests either. So that's how she got away with things. So I always think that that she was sort of the backbone of this whole group because they were going to get tossed out if if they didn't have an explanation for why they weren't sleeping with everybody. So I I love that part where she's she comes in and just and then she becomes she befriends a lot of the women too. Right, and she's able to gather intel. She's able to gather her own stream of intel from those relationships as well and and it it also gives her insight into the politics of the club right her relationship with the women she can hear some things that maybe jay would not have been in a position to gather that kind of intel who's trending up who's trending down in terms of right like leadership and and things like that Exactly. It was a, it was sort of a wonderful, unexpected um, sidebar to this whole operation, and so I think she she did she brought a lot to this group, and um, and I think that just her just who she was, she she had a huge role in helping them get to their ultimate goal, which was to become full patched. You know, they wanted to be members, made members of the Hell's Angels. Right. So. At this point in the investigation, they've already demonstrated that they're willing to kill, but they haven't killed yet, but they're willing to kill. That goes a long way. And one thing, when I'm reading your book, I notice how, you know, you don't think about these things necessarily as just someone who is, reads about true crime is that when you have an undercover operation, there are practical considerations like budget and like how long is this going to last? And so there's there's pressure by the prosecutors and others, like, expedite this keep you know let, let's wrap let's wrap this up we don't we can't spend money on this forever so the the undercover ops have to keep on thinking of ways to fast track this this process make a lot of money be a tough guy be willing to kill and then they come up with this idea like the best way to fast track this is to actually kill someone and so uh, be just wait for a moment, the audience, because they don't they don't kill someone. Just spoiler alert, but to at least this ruse to, to think to make the Hell's Angels think that they're assassins. So um, in, the, in the underworld landscape of the outlaw biker clubs, there are rivals. So you don't just have the Hell's Angels. You have you have the outlaws, the banditos, the Mongols. And the Hell's Angels get along with some of these clubs and other clubs they don't get along with. And in this case, the Mongols, they were big rivals, did not get along with them. So tell us about this idea of how they're going to demonstrate to the Hells Angels that we're capable and not only capable, but we'll execute Mongols if we see them. And they carry out this like really extraordinary operation. Tell us about that. So, um, so you're right. They had to keep producing in order to keep the, the money, you know, keep prosecutors and everybody happy funding this. But what happened was because of the extreme, um, kind of how they had to stay up all the time in this group. Um, you know, Jay was popping, was, was popping Red Bulls and pills. Well, they had this confidential informant named Pops who was really languishing. He was really having a hard time. He was, he was losing himself and, um, they needed to extricate him out. So his, uh, boss and the powers that be at the ATF thought, you know, we have to get Pops out because he's, he's going to either compromise the investigation or he's going to die. <laughs> and so they can't just extricate somebody out of the Hells Angels. You know, there has to be a reason that somebody leaves because you don't leave that game. So they came up with this way that they were going to get Pops out. And that's what led to this ruse, this fake murder. So Pops, the story went that Pops was you know, there was this one, this Mo- Mongol who was wandering around in, in Magdalena, Mexico, and um, Jay went to his his buddies, at, you know, his Hell's Angels, and he said, um, "We're going to go down and take him out. Pops is going to go down and take him out." So they fake send Pops out there, and of course, Pops fake dies while he's taking out the Mongol. <laughs> so that's how they get Pops out of the investigation. But meanwhile the agents then have to stage a murder. So they have a, a real, you know, ATF agent pose as the victim. 
they put a, a cut on him, which is the colors, you know, their patches. It's from a seized Mongol vest. They put it on this guy. They dig a shallow grave. They put him in the shallow grave. They start snapping photos of him. They take a, a cow's stomach and they put it on his head so it looks like he's got a gunshot wound on his head. They, uh, they use theater blood and they take these photos and they fake this murder and they send these photos. They fed him, they FedEx it. They have to make it look like it's coming from Mexico and they FedEx it to the, the head of the Hells Angels. And, you know, they're, they don't. They don't know what to expect at that point. They they're hoping that they're going to be accepted, and and so the reaction that they get from the Hell's Angels is they get hugs and cheers, and Jay is suddenly made a full patch member because they've actually fake killed a Mongol, their their chief rival. So it was it was an extraordinary improvisation, extraordinary ruse, and they got away with it. And at that point is when, you know, the ATF said, we're done with this investigation. You have a very close call and we don't want to risk it anymore. You know, I mean, that's that's good. You became a made member and, you know, case closed. So, yeah, it's it's, it's really interesting and in, in how they were able to sell it in the sense of, first of all, it was smart to do it in Mexico because the Hells Angels at that point at least that chapter, their influence down there was limited. So they, they, it, it wasn't as easy for them to just verify if this is really happening. But also the idea of Pops, because I don't want to give away too much because I want people to read the book, but because he's he's an older dude, he's having some health issues, the idea that he would go down there and it would go bad and he would get whacked was totally believable. When you're reading the book, you're like, yeah, they would. you would totally believe that because even when he says, Jay says, I'm going to send Pops down there to take care of this guy – even the Hell's Angels are like, really, Pops? Are you sure? Are you sure he's the right dude to send out? Is he up to this, right? And so the idea that that would go bad was totally believable, right? And um, so then they get they get, um, and this is what I meant by saying expedite the process was if they actually carried out an execution, he he was certain, and it turned out to be true that they would say, okay, we're ready to to patch you in. Um, so they shut it down. It's getting too, you know, it's getting too crazy at that point. You can't continue it. Tell us about that. What happens? How many people are charged? What kind of charges? Walk us through that that process, the after the after process. Sure. So one of the main reasons that they had to shut it down, I mean, there were, there were lots, but one of the main ones is because they had staged this murder with a rival gang member, that they were worried now they were actually going to have an all-out biker war. I mean, you can't just have that happen, get patched in, and, and and everybody goes on their merry way. So they didn't want a biker war. So that's when, um, you know, the the cops came in, the ATF came in, they they handcuffed these people, they, they took them out. And so what happens in the aftermath is there's 16 people that are indicted, and they're indicted on, on RICO and all kinds of charges. And the uh, the prosecution is is moving forward. And this is this is interesting because it coincides with um, this is sort of the background or PS of what was going on behind the scenes with with me <laughs> because the book is done, the indictments are pending, and I am freaking out because this is a huge investigation. People have put their lives at stake for this, never been done before, and my publisher wants to release the book before these 16 people are going to be indicted. So I have a huge issue with that. And I, you know, and so I'm, I'm pleading with my publisher, you've got to wait. I cannot be the attorney in Arizona that ruins this prosecution. And yeah. so the morning that the, the book is supposed to be released, I open up the newspaper and all 16 cases have been dismissed. They've all been dismissed and they've been dismissed because of problems with confidential informants. So that's sort of like the PS to this where the, the U.S. Attorney's Office doesn't want to get involved in this. And so it becomes this this crazy, horrible like aftermath. You know, they risk their lives. They do all of this. They get to these kingpins and the whole thing gets dismissed because of a technicality with the confidential informants. So. That's where um, my husband's case comes in. So they realize that these 16 indictments are going down. The book gets released. Now 
my name is out there. My husband comes home and he, and his name has been outed in a search warrant. (laughs) So now we realize how horrible this whole thing is because he is handling the asset forfeiture part of the case, which has to do with all of the clubhouses. So everything that is seized from the clubhouses is part of his investigation. So that's where the whole thing goes south. And so Jay and his family now, well, Jay first has a target on his head because he's, of course, outed as a result of this. And he runs into a Hells Angel um, in a bar just while these prosecutions are pending. And the Hells Angel says to him, you know, you better watch your back because the rest for the rest of your life, you're going to be running from the devil. And that's where the title of the book comes from. Um, and so he literally doesn't know what to do. He's on the lam for a couple of weeks before he figures out that, you know, not only is there a target on his head, but now there's a target on his family's head. So they, they decide they're going to torture his family to get back at Jay. So they don't need Jay, they now need his family. So now he's really concerned about his family safety. So he decides quite brilliantly, I think, to come to hide in plain sight. So he becomes larger than life. He becomes a public figure. You know, he he decides, you know, if if you're gonna come after me, there's gonna be some barriers here because I'm gonna be a public figure when you do it. But a year after, in 2008, his house gets burned down. And so, you know, it's done, in a very, you know, kind of gang style and nobody really ever pins it on the Hells Angels, but he believes that the Hells Angels have burned his house down. So it, it starts this whole lawsuit. Jay then sues the ATF and, you know, and, and wins <laughs> for failing to protect him. So it is really like a whole aftermath. There's a whole nother like case after that follows this incredible investigation. Yeah. I mean, uncle Sam, I'm, I'm not just trying to talk shit here, but th- this this case does not go well for Uncle Sam. And I don't know, there's something with the ATF. I mean, I, I've talked to some FBI and, and, and DEA guys. Um, I've only talked to one ATF agent as a source, but um, I'd be curious to know more about, like, this these sort of massive, like, institutional failures. I mean, you think of, like, Waco back in the 90s and then um, the um, uh, Fast and Furious case, gun running, that went south. and um, was embarrassing. And then this, this case, I don't know. I mean, that's sort of beyond the point of our conversation, but it's it's something (laughs) that I think about as someone who teaches criminal justice and criminology courses. But um, yeah, I mean, his position was that the ATF did not have his back, right? Like after he's exposed, they sort of, they seem to walk away from him. I mean, what, what do you think that was about? I mean, what, was that some infighting at the ATF? I mean, what was? Or didn't, didn't you say like they? Some of them thought he was too much of a hot shot or something like that. I mean, what what was up with that? Like walking away from him? It's pretty complicated, but I think one of the um, things, and I think Jay even says this himself. I mean, he did get. They had some wrangling at the end of this. Um, investigation where Jay really wanted it to continue. He fought very hard for the investigation to continue. He became a full patch member and he thought that was the whole goal, even though it took 18 months to get there, that was the goal of it. And now he believed he could get a lot of intelligence that way. And so he really thought that the investigation had been cut off too soon. So he had a lot of disagreement with the ATF on that. Um, It wound up getting a lot more involved and complicated than that, which he writes about in his second book, um, which I can't remember the name of though. Catching Hell, I think is what it's called. Yeah. But um, so he, he covers that whole lawsuit and that whole investigation. But but certainly in the beginning of this, they didn't protect him. You know, they didn't protect his family. They just sort of exposed him and hung him out there. I mean, he he just risked his life. He he did something really extraordinary. But the ATF didn't, you know, they didn't want to be involved in it. They, they wanted to be removed from that. And then, and then of course there was a lot of controversy involving the confidential informants that were used, um, not pops, but some of the other ones. And, and so that kind of sent an offshoot for the whole case. So it was, it was just a mess following it. And I think the ATF wanted to distance themselves from it and consequently, you know, kind of hung them out to dry. Yeah. I think if I'm not mistaken in your book, you talk about one of the confidential informants, was a suspected murderer, right? Like they, they might have killed someone 
while they were being a CI, right? I mean, yeah, right. that can really cause some, some problems with an investigation. I mean, you think about like what happened in Boston with like Whitey Bulger, right? Like he was like protected by the FBI and he was doing all sorts of horrible, I mean, murder, yeah. drug dealing, extortion, you know? So that's, that's definitely not going to look good. Um, just, I, I know we have a little bit of time left and I, I definitely want to at least touch upon the last Chicago boss. Um, but one thing I was wondering in your book is, I know I'm backtracking a little bit, but part of his undercover role, Jay's, is to convince the outlaws or the, the Hells Angels that he has these affiliations with the Italian mafia. And there's actually a guy, like a guy that was an actual former mafioso in, in Vegas who, um, I don't know if he was in witness protection or something, but somehow they get him to, to play the role of an Italian mafia guy. And Jay introduces him to some of the bikers and they believe it because this guy knows how to present himself as a mafia guy because he actually was a mafia guy. Are you at liberty to say who that who that was? What the name of that mafia guy? Do you know uh, who he was in real life? Because you don't you don't you just say he was a mafia guy from Jersey, I think, or something like that. Uh, do you know who he was? Yeah. Just out of curiosity. I do know who he was, but I I don't think it'd be a good idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I mean, who knows? I don't know if he's still out there doing. I, I don't know. So okay, that's fair. I was just I was just wondering. I, I thought that was an interesting part of the story. Um, so we got a little bit of time left, and I I hope we can have have you back again because there's so many other things you you have other books we'll mention that we we probably won't have time to get to. But um, another big book you have that I read is the Last Chicago Boss. And uh, my life with the outlaw, uh, Chicago Outlaws Motorcycle Club, with uh, Big Pete James, Peter Big Pete James, and Carrie. They co-authored it. How do you transition from writing about the bikers in Arizona, specifically the Hell's Angels, and then now you're going to be writing about another outlaw club, which is the Outlaws in Chicago? Right. So the interesting thing that happened um, since writing Running with the Devil, that was my first book, and the, and the last Chicago box boss was my last outlaw book. So I wrote about the big five with the exception of the banditos. So I really touched on, on all of the major biker gangs. And, and every time I approach a book, you know, I, I want it to, I'm approaching it from the standpoint of a story. I mean, what, what is interesting about the story? Because there are certain commonalities, of course, between all of the biker gangs, but big Pete's story was particularly interesting to me because he contacted me after reading my other book, Vagos, Mongols, and Outlaws, um, because I featured his clubhouse in there. So there was a big, you know, to do that happened at his Northside clubhouse. And so he read that book and he was very intrigued that I got the accuracy of that clubhouse and the outlaws down. I mean, that, that was his baby. So he contacted me and said, I'd like, you know, I'd like to tell you my story. I'll tell you the real story. And so, um, so Big Pete contacted me to write his story, and at the time, he was uh, he was dying. He had terminal kidney cancer, and uh, P.S. He's still alive. <laughs> but, yeah, I thought so. I thought yeah, so. He was dying, and um, and so the interesting thing about him is he's really considered the godfather of the Chicago Outlaws. He was considered the godfather. And that's a whole nother interesting point is there is this sort of hierarchy between the mafia and the outlaw motorcycle gangs who are the mafia on wheels, but there's sort of a, there's a tier, there's a layer there. So he was considered the godfather of the Chicago outlaws. And, um, and his, his book is really about his rise to fame in the Chicago outlaws, but he didn't start out wanting to be the godfather of the outlaws. He always wanted to be the boss of Chicago. From the time he was seven years old, he wanted to be the boss of Chicago. And the outlaw motorcycle gang became that vehicle, became a vehicle for him to do that. So he was completely, you know, it goes against the mold of anybody who ever joins these, <laughs> these outlaw gangs. Um, he was college educated. He was, he's married to a, an IT person in, in, in the tech world. He, he just doesn't fit the mold at all. But what was fascinating to me about this, this book is that he, he grew up in a family that was incredibly intelligent, and he was incredibly intelligent. I would call him cunning, cunning, calculated, very intelligent. Um, and he just needed a way in, a way in to become the boss of Chicago. And his family loved to play board games, which is also kind of interesting because I don't know too many people that still do that. But he played a lot of Risk and Monopoly. 
and go. And he learned all about acquiring territories. I mean, it's all about real estate, you know, taking over the territories of, of things. So when he wound up um, joining the, the outlaws, there's a long story to it, but when he wound up, it was in the 90s. And the 90s was like the heyday of the outlaws. I mean, that's they were at war with the Hells Angels and they were, you know, doing all kinds of crazy things. That's when Taco Bowman, who was the international president, was there. So his rise to fame was was really kind of um, involved. It was long and involved, but he always had his eye toward acquiring territory. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that being the boss because you talk about this in your book like there's always this mystique in Chicago of like Al Capone and things like that but my sense is that Peter Big Pete like he fancies himself the Michael Corleone of of the outlaw biker world <laughs> right like I mean but like literally that's what he says right he he, be, he not only does he he reads the books the Mario Puzo novels right the films but but also his pedigree is different like yeah, he is, he is an educated dude. More comes from a more stable background, um, and and he's very bright. And and it's interesting that the, you know this idea of does art imitate life or the other way, whatever. But but he's very conscious of like he's the Michael Corleone of of the biker world. I just think that's interesting. If you want to comment on that, yeah, it, it's sort of like I mean I don't know if I would go so far as to say he's almost making a career. The biker world, but in a sense, he is. I mean, he's using them. He's doing these extraordinary things that he's, um, you know, <laughs> I think he he was the first person for I mean, he, it's his rise to it. He, he First of all, he's, he's a college grad. He becomes the head of his fraternity. He becomes a, a loyal order of the moose, which I didn't even know what that was when I first, <laughs> I didn't even know what a moose was. Um, he rises to power there. He realizes that that can be a vehicle to create his own club like a prototype club so he he creates his own prototype club which is um I forget what it's called the the royal order and he becomes the head of that so then he he learns that because he's created this prototype club in very similar fashion to um what jay dobbins did which i think is so interesting the two bucks kind of mirror each other in that way he creates a a fake club to convince himself that he's worthy of joining the outlaws. So the Royal Order is his club, and then he, he joins the outlaws. But um, so he becomes sort of the CEO of his criminal or of this criminal organization. And, and you kind of get the sense that if he didn't choose a criminal syndicate, he could have been the CEO of, of a huge corporation. You know, he could have been a partner in a law firm. He could have been, you know, the, the head of of anything really. So he, he then, in fact, he thinks he talks about at one point he could have been a televangelist, you know, he could have been anything that involved selling something to people. So I think in a strange way, it was sort of, a, you know, he was toying with them. He was kind of exploiting the, the vehicle by which to get to be the boss. Um, so I, that's what I think fascinated me about this book is that everything he did was very calculated and cunning. Um, there was a confederation of, the, of clubs where it's all the clubs joining together. So you have the African American clubs, the Hispanic clubs, you know, the street clubs, all these clubs coming together in one place. And he appoints a female secretary. Well, you know, women are not highly regarded in, in the outlaw motorcycle world, but he gives them that power. So he does everything that is opposite of what the club is, you know, what the roots of the club are. So it's kind of fascinating how, you know, what he does with that. Yeah, you really get the sense from your book that he's a politician, right? And and the way he's able to form um, coalitions. So like in, in Running with the Devil, some of the other Hells Angels guys, they say, yeah, we, we, we knew some Italian mafia guys, maybe the joint or something. And uh, I've worked with them a little bit. But in, in, in the last Chicago boss, um, the, the Outlaws Club, it's, it's not it's not something like just oh maybe kind of like it, it's an actual alliance that they have with the Italians <laughs> joint criminal enterprises working together and then as you point out other ethnic biker clubs so he really strikes me as like this diplomat kind of politician um, and it's just really extraordinary when you when you when you think about someone in the gangland who has those kinds of skills yeah he he is really one of a kind I mean he did he had this very symbiotic relationship with the the mafia. The, the outlaws are, you know, notoriously the foot soldiers of the mob. 
And, you know, he took that to a whole new level. And he also developed these extraordinary partnerships with law enforcement, which, you know, I always like to call the thin blue line, you know, like what, what it, where exactly does that line cross? Because, you know, he would have, he had this phrase where there were cops that were good to him and cops that were good for him. So, you know, the, the cops needed the outlaws there to keep away the other riffraff and the outlaws needed the cops to kind of look the other way when they did their dealings. So they sort of had this strange sort of relationship. Um, and the same thing was true with the mafia. So that's why the Chicago outlaws were so fascinating to me because it, it really, they had to work in partnership with a lot of these other organized crime syndicates. Yeah. So did he talk about, I don't think this is in the book, but I can't remember. Does he talk about the Detroit outlaws at all? Did he, or did he just even privately discuss with you like, um, this just because we're, we broadcast here from Detroit, so I'm just curious. I know there are there's an outlaw chapter here. Did that ever come up with him, your discussions with him? You know, it did. And, and the interesting thing is so the outlaws have regions, and he was in charge of the white region. And um, so he did talk about that. And one of the things he was very clear about is he wanted to always make sure that whatever we talked about, whatever we wrote about was going to be true for the Chicago outlaws. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so I don't know how different it is in other regions, but he did point out that there were differences. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to trust that, that he knows what those are, but, um, but it did cross over a little bit in the book with the, the death of Hojo, who was um, part of the red region of the outlaws. And so he was not in the Chicago area or not in the Detroit area. That was a Virginia outlaws. So, right. so they do have, some differences and and I don't know exactly what those are. I mean, it's you know I think what he was mostly um, and I don't even know if poking fun is really the right way of saying it, but I think he was very disappointed in how um, rule abiding the the outlaws were, the ones that he was dealing with. You know, he got into the outlaws to be a rebel, to be a nonconformist, to be you know, and, and to have a cause. So when he joined it, they had a cause. They were at war with the Hells Angels. And so their whole goal was to acquire territory and keep the Hells Angels out of Chicago. So by the time, you know, he's in the, the last years of him being the boss, by the time he reaches that status, the outlaws have sort of lost their purpose. The, the Hells Angels are already in Chicago. They're not at war. There isn't anything that is generating this drive or this motivation for them to be the real rebels that he, he remembered them as. Instead, they were very rule-abiding. They had a, a, an extensive constitution. They had all kinds of bylaws and laws. And I think that a lot of the, the chapters, I mean, that's probably what's common in a lot of the, the chapters um, probably all along the East Coast, not just exclusive to Chicago. But um, so I think that was that was disappointing to him. And I think in a lot of ways, um, you know, he was dis he was wishing that the outlaws would just be a little bit, you know, more rebellious. Um, there's a funny scene in the in the book where the the outlaws, I guess an important distinction, you know, from the Hells Angels that Jay was involved with, the outlaws had day jobs. I mean, they had like, they went to work by day and by night they were outlaws. And so a lot of times um, Pete would organize these runs and runs was just another word for a meeting. I mean, they were a party. You know, these were get togethers, which would be the equivalent of like business networking for us. But he would organize these things and, and his, um, his outlaws would come to him and say, do you think I could skip this weekend? You know, can I, <laughs> it's Valentine's day. I want to spend it with my, you know, my old lady. And he would get very frustrated with that. You know, he said, are you an outlaw or are you like a part-time outlaw? You know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't in his mold of what an outlaw should be. So I thought it was hilarious. And, um, so I, so I think a lot of what, so I think Pete actually was kind of bored in some respects from this, you know, he's a very intelligent guy. He was, a little bit dis disappointed or disillusioned by um, by what was happening with with his group or his chapter, and so he at one point invented a, a fake group. He invented the Cosmic Writers, you know, and and that was sort of he took a, he took a hiatus from from the Outlaws, and he spent like four days holed up in his in his house and kind of invented this club and recruited a lot of people in this club. He, he developed patches for them, uh, constitution, bylaws. He developed all of this, and it was all fake. And then he realized 
that he that people that he was recruiting because he recruited a lot of people and he made a lot of money out of this. It was crazy in the span of four days. So then he realized that these people wanted to meet people, members of the Cosmic Writers. So he then had to recruit another sort of puppet club from the Outlaws, the Black Pistons, to come in and pose as the Cosmic Writer. So he was always involved in some kind of, you know, I don't know, like a like theater within theater kind of. So in that respect, it was similar to what um, the infiltrators were doing in, in the Hell's Angels. It was interesting. Yeah I, yeah, I was just thinking the same thing, the parallel, because in the Arizona case, they're supposed to be the, the solo angels, and, and this comes up a lot, is people asking, you know, why do I only see like two or three, maybe four of you guys? <laughs> like, like if you're a club, there presumably are more guys. And, and, right, and, and this is good, gets back to the budget stuff, right? The, FTA, the ATF is saying, we don't care. It's, this is all we can give you are these many operatives. So Jay had to keep on coming up with these like reasons as to why you only see two or three of us. Um, and a similar thing in the, in the Chicago case study too, right? Eventually people, you know, it doesn't take long before people are like, if this is supposedly an outlaw biker club, how come there's only one or two people, right? So you see how to get creative <laughs> to, to, to explain that away. Um, yeah. It's fascinating that the anthropology of, biker culture that at the macro level they are renegades and outlaws but then at the micro level right in a lot of ways right this this fixation on rules and and um hierarchy and very strict enforcement of these bylaws and things like that it really is an interesting juxtaposition between their macro level behavior which is which is renegade which is outlaw but in their own world not so much yeah <laughs> That's right. fascinating. Well, that, that's fascinating to me for all the all the books that I've written on that. I mean, without a, a hierarchy or a structure, then you have anarchy, right? So even in the prison systems, there's a hierarchy. You know, so everywhere you go, like the police force, there's a hierarchy. Scouting, there's a hierarchy. You know, it, it just it struck me as so pronounced in Pete's book because of all of the organizations. He was in the fraternity, which has a hierarchy, you know, and the loyal order of the moose. Uh, so they, they all are these rule abiding people because they know without that, they're going to have anarchy. And I thought um, just some of the hilarious moments in, in the book, at least for me, were, you know, where they're having meetings. They, they always seem to have meetings, to have a meeting, to have a committee, have a meeting and to appoint people to their meetings. And <laughs> pretty soon it's like, it's like a real job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it's hilarious. I mean, they don't they don't get anything done. And it reminded me so much of corporate America, yeah. and that's um, right. You know? right. Uh, that's great. Another thing that's interesting in the, the Chicago book I find is when I talk to my students, I teach a gangs and organized crime course, and if we're talking specifically about the outlaw biker clubs, and they're asking me about like the the the, the, the individuals who are members and and criminality and I and the way I explain it to them and you're an expert so correct me if I'm wrong is that well there's a spectrum like it's it's not they're not all like doing the same thing like there there are some guys who are sort of what what you're talking about who are like yeah maybe they're hell raisers on the weekend and they're tough guys don't get don't get me wrong uh but in a lot of other ways they lead very conventional lives have a day job family things like that and then and uh, the other other end of the spectrum, you have some straight up gangsters. You have some straight up like all our bikers who are just they're straight up gangsta. And so there's a spectrum. Like it depends. Like I, I don't I don't think you can just say every outlaw biker is this or that. It it, it really depends on the 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 personality of that club and, and the people in there. Would you say that that's true? Yeah, I would definitely say that's true. It's it's kind of a fascination of the of the whole thing. I and mean, there there are so many different reasons for why people want to join too, which is kind of kind of interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I don't understand it. The thing that fascinates me so much about this is that there are police officers, and I think I touched on this in the book too, that really want to emulate the the bikers that they're arresting. I mean, they go out, they get the tattoos, they get the they they do the bike runs, and there are police clubs they call them biker clubs but you know sometimes that crosses the line i mean there there really are there really are police officers that seem to get a little too involved in in that world and and vice versa so it's it's just kind of an interesting um crossover no i i know that this is an issue with i would say it's becoming a problem is in the military as well a lot of outlaw biker guys are active duty military Guys, yes. and, and you get into questions of 
where does their, you know, are they, is it, are they devoted to protecting the constitution? Like you're supposed to be in their armed services or are you, is your first priority to the club? And so this, right. this, I think this is a problem. And I, I think the, I think DOD thinks it's a problem too. I, I think they're not doing very much about it and there's all sorts of political reasons why not, but, uh, and, and they don't like, they don't like to admit it, but if you look at their internal documentation, I think there's people in the Department of Defense who recognize this is a major challenge. How, how many how many outlaw bikers are active military personnel? I don't, I don't know if that was something you encountered in your research. I mean, you, you, you've done enough research. I'm sure that's something you're aware of. Yeah, no, it is. It's a major challenge, and it's a it's it's just an ongoing um, debate. And that's that whole you know fine line whether you're going to call them a club or a gang, right? I mean, the the police biker club and then the outlaw motorcycle gang, they call themselves a club. So it's, 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 that's exactly the argument, you know, like what are, are they committing crimes? Is it a criminal syndicate? You know, are they just out enjoying motorcycle? Are they just enthusiasts? And then you've got the whole pressure of, you know, American motorcycle association, which is, you know, this is a, uh, this is big pastime for people, you know, to go out on, on motorcycle runs. And so it's, it definitely does pose some challenges, I think, for, you know, for law enforcement. Yeah, and, I'm, and the reason why I, I use the term club, I mean, I, I know it's, it's semantics, but, um, and, you know, you, you know more about it than I do, but I'm not convinced, not that I'm a defense attorney, but I'm not convinced that, you know, Uncle Sam's argument that outlaw bikers are the same thing as the mafia, but just, just on motorcycles I'm not sure that that's true. Again, I think it depends on, I think it depends on the club, like sub clubs are gangs and and it is organized crime, but not necessarily. So that's why I use the term club. I just feel some, some attempt at due process here for, (laughs) because, you know, I think, I think you have this, 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 um, parrot or, um, what's the way I want to view, like this, um, I think that the hegemonic viewpoint of law enforcement right now, at least that the DOJ is, Outlaw bikers equal organized crime, and I'm I'm not convinced that that's necessarily true. I, I think there are definitely outlaw bikers and clubs that are involved in organized crime, 100. percent That's well established, well documented. Um, but I'm not sure that's the same thing as like if you're in the mafia, you are by definition a, a gangster, right? Like there's really no spectrum with with the Italian mafia, but like you're, I mean, some guys are obviously more violent than others and things like that. But by definition, I think you are part of a criminal conspiracy. And, um, I'm not sure that's the same case with the bikers. What are any thoughts on that? At like sort of a criminological level? Well, I mean, that's, that is the argument. That's the quintessential argument, um, for, and, and why it's been so difficult to prosecute. It's very difficult to prosecute. Um, in the Vago book I wrote, they, they were able to get indictments and prosecutions and convictions. And that was one of the very rare cases that it happened. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think for, you know, the way that I look at it is if you have to look at the motivation of, you know, why this group is coming together. And there are certainly lots of clubs out there that are not, outlaw gangs. So that's the distinction. If the goal is to acquire territory, to get money, you know, to do, I mean, it's really the the goal of, of any gang really is to, you know, monopolize a territory and to do it through any means. And usually it's through gun running or drugs or, you know, some kind of racketeering. And so that's the definition of why they're organized crime syndicates but you know are there members in there that are not involved in that i don't know i mean that's sort of the question right yeah. i mean I'm just one side, so yeah. i'm gonna like i'm gonna you know but i i think i've i've seen enough and, and here's an interesting point too i mean you know a lot of the people the the big wigs in these um these clubs slash gangs um they don't actually commit the crimes they send out their henchmen Right. Mm-hmm. So, so that is, that's the problem too. And how do you trace that back? So, you know, Pete, for example, had a lot of people working for him, under him, around him, you know, and so did the mob mm-hmm. who hired a lot of people to be their foot soldiers and work for them. So that's part of the challenge, I think, in working with these, these syndicates, right? I mean, so where, how do you catch them? 
how do you catch them in the act of doing the deed that they're doing? And that's why, um, you know, in, in, in the Vago book, there was actually a confession to a gangland murder. So that's how they got that person on murder charges and Rico. So there's, so that's the challenge I think in any of these criminal prosecutions is how do you link it? How do you create it? Cause it, it's all very, um, you know, under the table. Yeah. That's the, the exact point of Rico is even if you're not pulling the trigger, but you're a giving the order and B profiting from these criminal activities, then you are a gangster and you're part of a criminal conspiracy. And, um, which, which in, until Rico, right, it was very difficult to, to go after like the Italians because usually at least the, the higher ranking guys contract out the street level criminal activities. And you, you read that same thing in your book, right? The, the hierarchy of the Hells Angels and the outlaws do the same thing, right? There, once you re- reach a certain status, you're not getting your hands dirty, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> so you have, but but if you if you are still profiting from those rackets and giving orders, then then you're you're um you, you can be indicted un, under under RICO. So we're almost out of time, but just mention promote your other your other books because I, I know these are the two that I've read but as you mentioned you have two at least two other books that I'm aware of that I need to read you want to plug those before we sign off yeah sure thank you um Vagos Mongols and Outlaws is uh it's exactly what it, the title says it's an infiltration by um an undercover informant um and it was made into a television show called Gangland Undercover so if you don't want to read the book you can watch the show um, and then the other one I wrote was, um, the, uh, prodigal father, pagan son, and it's about the pagan motorcycle gang. And that, that one's probably my favorite of, of all of them. Yeah. I'm looking forward to reading that because, you know, they're in the news right now. Like that's the hot club. If you're a person who researches these things or a journalist, or even in law enforcement, if you study these things and follow these things, they're in the news right now. I don't know if you've been tracking that, but on the East coast, they're really making a push for, like you said, more territory, expanding the rackets, things like that. Yeah. I mean, they're part of the big five. And I think that um, they've sort of been, um, they haven't been as front row center as a lot of the other gangs, but I found them, I mean, there are differences between all of them. There are, there are lots of similarities, obviously, but there are definite differences for each one of the ones that I've written about. And that one was pretty fascinating. That story was pretty fascinating. So um, each one of them takes it from a different angle. That, that one takes it from a person who was born into the family and his father was the head of the pagans. So it's, uh, it's really interesting that, you know, it's not an infiltration case. It's his life in that world. Yeah, that's actually more of a parallel with the Italian mafia as well, because we know that that's the case. Not always, but in some cases you are born into it, right? Like it go- sometimes it goes back generations. So that, that's interesting to see a case study like that with, in this case, the, the outlaw bikers. So you want to mention your website? People can find out more information about about you, your projects, your books, things like that? Sure. Thank you. Um, my website is just my name, carriedrobin.com. And um, I have a my latest book, my new book that's coming out next summer, <laughs> is on the, it's not even on bikers at all. It's a total segue. Um, and it's on the Aurora, Colorado mass shooting. So I wrote about the that mass shooting case and the psychiatrist who treated him. Wow. Uh, I think my students will be interested in that. My, a lot of my students are, um, you know, my specialization is gangs and organized crime, but a lot of my students, they're, they're more interested in serial killers and mass shooters. And I, I joke around with them at my, my dark sense of humor. I'm like, what, what's wrong with gangsters and outlaws? Can't you read <laughs> these horrible examples? Like, I just think, I don't know. I was getting the spectrum of like, uh, I get it. Violence is wrong no matter what. But um, so I, I think that'll be a popular, I think that'll be a popular book. Um, I, I, I hope so. Um, so, well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we, we, I really would like to have you back on because I want to talk about your other books and there's even some things with these two books that I didn't get to. So I really appreciate your time. Any last other plugs you want to throw out there before we sign off? No, just uh, thank you very much for having me. And, um, you know, I, I too am very interested in organized crime, obviously. I've spent a lot of years doing it and I find it fascinating on a lot of levels. I think it mirrors a lot of some of the, the issues that are very relevant to, you know, our own culture. So 
Yeah. Interesting. Well, I agree. Thanks again so much. We really appreciate your time. For those of you listening or watching, make sure you like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. Eventually, we're going to get presence on Instagram, have these videos up on YouTube. So, Carrie Drobin, thank you so much. People go out there, buy her books. OG Podcast. We'll see you next time. Thank you.